Hello everyone. Uh, as you've just heard, I'm going to talk to you about the uh, scene rather about architect criticism and publication and how these sit in relation to a culture of building. I work for the Architectural Review, also known as the AR, which for anyone who doesn't know is an architectural magazine established in London in 1896. The editorial team today is small, tightly knit and surprisingly young. And we're in this interesting position of rethinking how architecture and publication should or could work, but doing so in relation to a weighty 124 year legacy. The AR has seen many editorial teams inhabited many different identities and has been subject to economic, political and stylistic influences from outside itself. So rather than a single thing with one position, mission or stance, it's rather this title that stands for many iterations and we are just one of these. The history of how architectural publishing has been done and the role played by architectural criticism is as varied as the architecture it concerns. They are, after all, part of the same interconnecting culture, affected like art, like photography, literature, music, film, like all of life, by ideological shifts and technological innovations on multiple scales. I'm not going to trace anything like a full history of architectural publishing or criticism for you because such a thing would be necessarily very reductive. But I do want to bring in a few instances from the Architectural Review's own history here as a way to think about the positions of both the publication and the critic and how those are interchangeable, how those are changeable, but also how those positions are not neutral in relation to the rest of the culture. They have significant power in how architecture is perceived and therefore in controlling what will be built in the future. In 1947, the then editorial team of the AR published an essay on the subject of its own policy writing that for any art in England, there is a public, so long as it lends itself to being written about well. Indeed, the reason why architecture during the Edwardian interval lost so much prestige lies in the fact that no one had been found between John Ruskin and John Betjeman to write about it quite well enough. The point being made was that the culture was dependent on criticism, that without literary discussion, there would be no public concern, no interchange of ideas, no growth or progress. And without that exchange, without that criticality being part of the design, what is architecture and where might it depart from other fields like construction? And that's the very issue that the first architectural magazines that began to appear at the end of the 19th century were tackling. They set out on distinguishing architects for good or for ill from surveyors, contractors, engineers, and elevating their status to one that accommodated artistry as well as technical expertise. This was to be accessed and expressed in print through concern with aesthetics, along with usefulness or technical understanding. And the architectural review was from its start visual as well as verbal. It was an arts and crafts affair and its first editorial board um, were founding members of the Art Workers Guild and fans of William Morris, John Ruskin and Augustus Pugin. Early editions of the magazine looked to earlier generations of architects as well as contemporary buildings and much of the writing was slow paced and achingly diligent. And I'm going to read briefly from a building study from 1902 of the French Abbé Fontivreau. The visitor is tolerated rather than welcomed. He is admitted with formalities through a frowning gateway, which standing on the main street seems to occupy the site of the original main entrance to the precincts. After being conducted across two courts, the first of which exhibits nothing that is not modern, he is ushered through the cloisters into the chapter house and thence into the church or rather its eastern half. Part of the domestic buildings he perceives to be still standing and his guidebook may have hinted at a remarkable kitchen of which he catches a glimpse on the right before entering the cloisters. The text is very long and mostly just descriptive of what exists at the Abbey. Simple explanations of form with occasional evaluative judgments and elements being de described as remarkable, refined or picturesque. What's rarer are the instances where he become play, becomes playful. The building is given a face to frown with, given agency for tolerance or acceptance. 
With the reference texts that accompany him, the writer goes on to mark the dates of every stone in a coolly historical manner, his tone reaching a register of dizzying objectivity, and the rare sympathetic moments are dislocated to the voice of the visitor, the author's proxy and his outlet for subjective speech. He makes this distinction between the objective writer and the subjective visitor, as in this style of criticism, there's a value given to objectivity that has to do with authority, with both the appropriateness the task of telling you about the film. For what was a relatively new profession of architectural criticism, and this relatively recent distinction of architecture as an artistic profession, there was still work to be done in defining this position, and authority was paramount. Objectivity, traditionally understood as a fundamental distance or disconnect between the writer and the subject, was, and by many still is, considered to be neutral and thought to be the way towards real truth. But there is very little in the world that can actually approximate something like objective truth, and any sentient animal will be unconsciously swayed by their own history and desires, by the conditions that make up their own point of perception, as much as they might try to fight that or believe themselves to be neutral. So the writer here is not presenting too much as fact that should reasonably be disputed, but the factual tone itself and that air of truthiness is inherently conservative and the conventions it uses guard themselves against challenge by their presentation as truth. To take a common example of how this can be harmful, the visitor is written as he, so this character who has been written into the text so that the reader can place themselves in the building is specified as male, and that matters. Most women are quite used to this operation of placing themselves into the generic he, but that condition of being used to something doesn't mean it isn't having an impact, either subtly or subconsciously. This idea of the, of the critic's voice, and by extension, the voice of the magazine as having this quality of objectivity ties into this other role of the publication that it sustained through much of the 20th century as being a living archive of the most significant architecture of the day. The process of selection of, of what goes in and how many pages it's given is crucial. It decides what is remembered and just as significantly what is forgotten. Looking back at our own archive and at other historical publications, the choices of who has been celebrated and who has been excluded is certainly not neutral, even if those decisions were not conscious. The archive decides what is worth remembering, and this archive almost invariably privileges white European men over anyone else. The magazine is then this double thing that on the one hand is documenting, creating the raw matter that will make up architectural history and on the other is driving architectural history in what it decides to communicate to the public, in what it stores for a future public. The action or process of that documentation, both driving and shaping the current scene and the future of architectural culture at the same time that it claims to record it. When architecture outside of this narrow Eurocentric scope was featured, it was not necessarily done so disparagingly but it does have something of a colonial air to it. There was a practice of sending the same old list of trusted contributors, almost all of them white men, out to write about these things that they were often not an expert in. There's something to be said for selecting someone who simply writes well, or perhaps who can come at things from a distance, but doing so with the same old list of writers inevitably places the author's position, and therefore the position of the magazine, as coming from a European approach. Of course, we are London based and there's only so much we can do to reduce the impact of that position on what we print and we are certainly not perfect. But the voice and the position of the writer is something that we take very seriously and we're actively working to make these choices consciously rather than reflexively. Some of our writers are still white, still European, still men and not every writer we've commissioned has in retrospect been the right person for the job. Uh, it's like any form of unlearning where we're having to correct not only our past practices, but work to, to make our present ones as good as they can be. We have to remain conscious of this position because rather than evaluate a building within the history and conditions of the place in which it sits, analysis by the European author tends to place any work in relation to a European tradition, 
giving out praise based on similarities or divergences from what has been done before in Europe. It is what that particular writer knows best and it's quite natural to compare something new to something you know. But it means that even in discussion of architecture outside Europe, the centrality of Europe is further canonized. And even when what is being featured has nothing to do with him, the European writer <clears throat> often makes that absence central in an orientalizing gesture, highlighting how extremely other the subject is or how untouched by European hands. So who writes these things is just as significant as what is included. And this is something that we're trying to be conscious of. As an example, in February, we dug this piece from AR September 1936 out of the archive as we published a new piece on the threats of age and civil war posed to the conservation of ancient Yemeni earth architecture. The piece from the archive was written by Osbert Lancaster, who was then a member of the AR's editorial team and was concerned that the finely decorated mud buildings of Hadramut were under threat from what he called European barbarism, from the influence of cheap mass produced items from the West. He uses some quite demeaning language, even as he praises the architecture, and the argument seems to put forward that the city should be preserved as some kind of museum piece, with little of the voice or concerns of the people who actually live there. So in looking for writers now, especially in looking at something that we're less familiar with, we look for specialists, ideally someone from that place or who lives or works locally, who works in the concerned field. For the new piece we did in February, we commissioned, um, uh, pardon my pronunciation, Salma Samar Damluji, who works on earth construction and rehabilitation projects in Hadramut, who had established a foundation for the conservation of buildings in that area. The hope is that a specialist or someone local might be able to uncover something that a foreigner wouldn't and might be able to get to the heart of the matter. Returning to this idea of, of, of authority that I briefly touched on when talking about this position of apparent objectivity, it's the local specialist who has actual authority. The intention or the hope is that their particular subjectivity cuts much closer to the truth than the feeling of truthiness conveyed by the objective tone. And their proximity is not preventative of seeing a bigger picture, it's in fact a source of power and precision. And the question of subject matter of what gets published. Looking back at this idea of building an archive, we are now at a stage where this role of documentation has all but disappeared from the remit of the print publication. With only so many pages, of course, there's a limit to what can make the cut. And with 10 issues a year, by the time the magazine is printed, most new buildings will have already made the rounds on the internet. Sites like Dazine and Arc Daily are fast and they are prolific. And while there is a job of selecting what goes online, there's also infinite space and the conditions demanded by the format encourage a constant stream of new articles. So for a print publication, we now have limited access to this realm of the new and a vastly changed responsibility with regard to documentation. And so the game has quite rapidly shifted in the past 10 or 15 years. As the impact of these parameters has reduced, it has raised the question both of the role of the publication, but also how we can possibly choose what to feature with rigor out of the vast array of possible projects. One way we do this has been to introduce issue themes to generate a framing device for what we commission. Some are clear in their relation to architecture with themes like soil or preservation and some are more suggestive like tourism, darkness, masculinities, failure, oceans, and money. The idea is to come at this vast realm of new projects and architectural ideas from a newly defined angle each time, framing different positions on how architecture relates to a greater global context. We choose these because they feel timely, often based on a couple sparking ideas that then expand into a series of angles and unfold into a whole field. And these limit our scope just enough to generate more than when trying to choose from anything in the world. With a theme in mind and a budget, we will build a list of ideas that fall underneath it. So 
for the May issue on tourism, it was about the Venice Biennale and Expos, about dark tourism. We talked about modernist ski resorts, ecotourism, shortcuts in the city, postcards and hotel labour. The buildings are chosen largely because they are developing an argument, usually an argument that has something to do with the theme they sit with. They are telling a story that reaches further than the limit of their walls, sometimes further even than what the architect is able to control. If we aren't able to show a building to, to the world for the first time, we will give depth to the story that you won't find in a press release. We will look at how it sits within a greater context and we will look at its full impact. In October last year, we devoted an issue to Brazil featuring a photo taken by Ciro Miguel on the roof of the recently completed Sesc 24 de Mayo by Paulo Mendes de Russia and MMBB on the cover. We also featured the building inside as we felt that its existence, its brief and design to be one of the most architecturally and culturally pressing conditions of the time. SESC, the commissioning body for the building, stands for Servicio Social de Comercio and was founded in 1946 by a group of private businesses, initially to provide health care to employees and their families, and it quickly diversified into other programs such as gyms, theatres and holiday camps. It now remains as a non-profit private institution that is funded by a 1.5% tax on workers in commerce. And at the time of publication, it maintained over 600 centers across Brazil, with 39 in Sao Paulo alone, most famously including Lina Bobadi's Sesc Pompeia. Some services are reserved for paying members, but these centers are all free for everyone to enter. And that is crucial, that these genuinely collective public spaces and services are open provisions for rich and poor alike. It's a socialist dream that is honestly in service of a public good. Over 13 floors, Sesc 24 de Mayo houses a theater, ground floor public space, a canteen, public living room, library, exhibition space, sports hall, dance studio, and is crowned by a pool on the roof, which continues downstairs around the cafe on the 11th floor. The building receives up to 10,000 visitors on an average weekday, the comedoria or the canteen serving around 1300 lunches. This is a rare manifestation of an institution that while private is actually functioning in service of the people, that's main aim is not the extraction of capital. However, the institution has been threatened by the current gov government with the halving of its funding. President Bolsonaro's Minister for the Economy, Paulo Guedes, has described it as putting the knife in with the determination of disrupting that social good. So the hope is that by featuring buildings like this, by putting them on our platform and publicly condoning them, we might see more examples like them in the future or, or support them when they're under threat. Putting forward buildings that we think are good is one of the oldest and most common purposes of publication and ties into an idea of what Manfredo Tafuri calls operative criticism, in which critics operate as architects by constructing and selling an architectural project themselves. But if this is all we did, the landscape would look a little dull and there's a lot of bad building that could continue unchecked. And praise and positive reinforcement is not the only way to go. Going back to that essay by the editorial team of 1947, they wrote that the review does not always deal with the right sort of architecture, a thing the more orthodox reader is inclined to find disturbing. There's this saying, this idea that any press is good press, that the fact that something has been published in our pages at all is a form of valorization or validation, that we should never publish a building that we don't think is good. And yes, there's an undeniable impact in giving things a platform, but just because we don't like something doesn't mean it isn't worth talking about. We wouldn't pluck any ugly thing from obscurity just to tear it apart but what if it's causing serious damage? What if it has already been heavily published elsewhere, heavily praised in that publication, and there's a whole part of the story missing? In February of 2019, we published an issue on failure. It's not just an issue about bad buildings or tragic collapses or ruin porn. It's, a, it's an issue that considers the fact that architectural history rejects failures 
preferring to concentra concentrate on tales of heroism, groundbreaking feats and innovative experiments. The cover featured an image of Mies van der Rohe's Farnsworth house under flood, almost unrecognizable with its carpets pulled up and its furniture raised on milk crates. The building was designed to counter flooding, raised up on pilotis to protect the dwelling from all but a once in a hundred years flood. Some things can't be foreseen and sometimes the efforts made towards foresight aren't enough. In this issue, we had a building study of the Bloomberg headquarters in London by Foster and Partners. The gleaming golden 1.3 billion pound building had won the Sterling Prize a few months previous, the most prestigious prize in British architecture. The essay was written by an architecture critic called George Kafka and concerned the fact of that prize giving itself. The jury had praised the project's sensitivity to site in central London and its highly detailed handcrafted materials. But much of the discussion of the Bloomberg headquarters fo focused on its sustainability credentials. And that didn't really sit right with us or with George. As he pointed out, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change had warned around the same time as the receipt of this prize was announced that we had 12 years to prevent global warming rising above 1.5 degrees centigrade and that doing so would require rapid, far-reaching and unprecedented changes to our society in order to be successful. This was unlikely to be a priority for Bloomberg LP, whose Bloomberg terminal software essentially underpins the financial services sector. In George's words, Bloomberg London's undeniably impressive innovation in its operational sustainability is an effective greenwashing of the company's substantial con contribution to the very engine room of climate destruction. To illustrate this piece, we scoured Jim Stevenson's extended set of photographs to find some that hadn't been released as part of the press set and hadn't yet been seen a million times over in the Sterling Prize coverage. The, the building is gleaming and golden, yes, but it looks inaccessible here. It looks like an edifice befitting its client. I've heard an argument from some that this type of criticism, the fault finding kind, is not constructive, that the building's already up and finding faults about it won't change that. But as the critic Steve Parnell has said, a demolition job on paper may not trigger actual demolition on site but it can at least hold the architect to account in the name of architecture. It can cause a shift in public opinion, stop the bad building from being replicated a thousand times over. This kind of criticism is of course not new. Provocation and polemic have long had a role in the AR and these, in these circumstances, the magazine becomes a political agent. The power we have to affect change is necessarily limited. The best we can do is provide a platform for certain ideas to use our circulation to support a conversation about what architecture should be. To this end, the AR has a long history of campaigns, positioning ourselves as a militant against one ill or another and railing for the preservation of the things we think are good. This spread and the covers that preceded it come from Man Plan, a 1970s campaign that defined a point in the history of the AR. And I'm reading a little here of what Steve Parnell has to say on the issue. Starting in September 1969 with frustration, Man Plan was essentially an alternative approach to architectural journalism that also functioned as a humanist manifesto. It focused not on buildings, but on people and not on individuals, but as a society. It is dark, both li literally and figuratively. The late Robert L. Wall, historian of architectural photography, was fond of saying that they even devised a special matte black ink to print the issues. This ink sucks in light quite literally, in contrast with modern architecture's preference for white space. Man Plan's message was brave, ahead of its time, hard hitting and so unpopular. In fact, it almost bankrupted the AR, gradually becoming more morbid with decapitated heads or skulls on all the covers, always eyeless, appearing on all eight of the issues. It was the last of the campaigns run under then editor Hubert de Kroon and Hastings, who for a quarter of a century had been campaigning for a more aesthetic approach to town planning. 67 years of age and with an eye on retirement, Hastings was aggrieved by the mess architects and planners had made 
and opportunities lost to reconstruct better and more beautifully after the war. This is Steve Parnell again. Man plan was something of a tantrum, an exasperated two finger salute at the profession he loved, deriving from his own frustration that his efforts to inspire a better world through his magazine had, he felt, failed. Hastings didn't need to build, Man plan was his architectural masterpiece. I'd also like to bring in Outrage here, which actually came about 15 years earlier out of Townscape, which uh, was urbanistically developing principles of the picturesque as a means of popularizing modernism in Britain. In June of 1955, the Architectural Review published an issue edited and almost single-handedly produced by Ian Nairn. The issue started with a prophecy of doom, of death by slow decay, of subtopia a compound word formed from suburb and utopia, i.e. making an ideal of suburbia. Nairn had driven from Southampton in the south of England to Carlisle in the north before heading to the Scottish Highlands, tracing the UK's subtopian sprawl and exhibiting his findings through mugshots of offending lampposts, arterial roads and garroted trees. His captions spat venom at public authorities, detailing the nature of his grievances in a catalogue that diagnosed the suburban seepage as an ordered demolition of the English landscape. These critical positions, full of ire and actually quite a big dose of bravado, are something closer to bare-knuckle boxing than the balanced politician's argument that is perhaps more prevalent now and is undoubtedly called for in some situations but they are also very entertaining and can be done too much. The public decimation of a well-known building or architect can be a satisfying diversion from the reader's perspective, but there's a danger here that to maintain that position, some subtle distinctions get lost along the way, that this kind of demolition is also the destruction of nuance. But there will still be space for the fierce or wrathful writer, as some arguments need to be made with wholehearted conviction and without prevarication. Since 1955, outrage has reappeared at various moments as a recurring feature, um, and from 2015 has maintained a position in every issue of the AR as a space designated for the discussion of the most evil of architectural misdeeds. This one was by Beatrice Colomina on the argument that blindness to women is blindness to architecture itself. These depart somewhat from evaluative criticism in the extent of their ire and persuasion at the point of that departure from nuance, but they are still very much about recent building, whether or not the building is of the right sort. But we also feel that we have a duty of care with regard to our own history a responsibility to close some of the gaps that have appeared in our own archive. I mentioned earlier that the archive decides what is worth remembering, that architectural history has been dependent on editors making the choice to feature one project over another, that it's actually very easy to neglect those who are being neglected elsewhere, to replicate preconceived ideas from others who are also replicating, and working against that pattern is something that needs to be done consistently. We are still finding these gaps where individuals or whole styles were neglected or excluded through the selection. All of postmodernism was certainly underrepresented in the AR as the editorship at the time preferred high tech or structural expressionism. Another notable example is that Lena Bobardi, who was scarcely published in the AR at all while she was working. Um, and we're left to wonder if it's because she was a woman or because she was working in South America, most likely a bit of both. The MASPI, the Museo de Arte de Sao Paulo, received only three pages in September 1952, five years after its opening. There was nothing of the Casa di Vidro, the Coati restaurant, Teatro Oficina, or even the Sex Pompeia until the last decade. There are a few ways we now try and go back and fill some of these gaps, particularly with two types of features, retrospective and revisit. These might be looking backwards somewhat, but we still try to do so when there's some current reason why we should look at this particular instance or trajectory now. Has the story changed in some way from how things stood before? Retrospective is more self-explanatory of the two, looking back at a whole string of works, at a whole career. In our preservation issue that came out around the end of last year, we published a retrospective of Bobardi, 
which we commissioned from Sol Camacho, an architect and the cultural director of the Bardi Institute. She wrote about Bobardi's life. She included the projects Bobardi was best known for, but she also included some of the, her lesser known work from Bahia, the work that had fallen furthest from public recognition and into the most disrepair. Revisit is something slightly different that can act to fill these gaps, but that also has something to do with a question about when a building is fit to be evaluated. It's one thing for a building to appear revolutionary at the time of its opening, but how does it fare five, 10 or 50 years later? Is it fulfilling the promises it set out in its design and has it been appropriated to reveal unexpected or new uses? The dominance of new media of the fast feed website reliant on a stream of press releases means that a condition has been created by the way in which architecture is disseminated. Any student or architect with an internet connection now has access to the most extensive repository of architectural production over the past 10 years, but that repository only functions skin deep. The format of the press release is by its nature extremely limited in its critical capacity designed by a public relations team to portray a building in its most positive light. It will usually consist of a selection of images taken sometime slightly before or slightly after the building's opening, before it has had any time to accrue signs of wear, and will be accompanied by a text provided by the architect or by the PR. Without a challenge posed to the relative realities of these constructed images, we exist in a floating field of unreality in which we have put our faith in the persistence of the image and in the design idea rather than the lived reality. This brings me to a crucial point in what we do, which is that we have a right to visit every building that we feature. It's something that we have insisted on for some years now and that we won't compromise on. Without visiting, you're simply relying on other reportage, on the architect's story or on the narratives that are already out there. This can be more than just inaccurate. The narratives generated around a building can differ wildly from their realities. One example is the Jinyu Community Library in Changsha, China. This was a library that was initially shortlisted for the AR Library Awards in December 2018, based on a text from the architects and images look, that looked like those on the screen. It had been completed in 2013 on paper described as a groundbreaking community library project. And I'm going to read for a second from the text about the library that is currently up on the architect's website. Its location at the base of the condominium tower departs from conventional typologies where luxurious lob lobbies and amenities would have been the norm by creating a social gathering space for all residents in the community to enjoy as part of their daily lives. In an effort to link the disjointed spaces and tie the architectural insertion back to the functional program of a library, a series of meandering millwork walls from the spatial, form the spatial device that seamlessly leads visitors from exterior to interior. As these walls transition between landscape walls, interior bookshelves, coffered ceilings and built-in furniture, the visitor's gaze shifts from being disdirected, framed, screened and obscured. Just as Just as in the microcosms captured in Chinese paintings, which resist the visual iconicity of a single perspectival view, the Jinyu Library is also experienced as a narrative revealed in fragments, unraveled in sections and curated vignettes. I've read this not because it's particularly exceptional, but because it really isn't. It's quite exemplary of architects' texts, using quite a lot of lofty language to tell you something artful about intention, but very little about the actual impact. So we sent a writer out to visit the project and he found something radically different from this promise of an unfurling narrative, this carefully curated interplay of views. The photo you see on the left is from the press pack that we received for the library. The one on the right was taken by a writer when he went to visit. You can see that they're of the same space taken from the opposite direction with the structural piece that has the mirror sitting on it um, you can see the ping pong table is where the window to the to the left hand side is and it's um, a lot of these millwork walls have been stripped out books any books within reach have been taken out and fans have been retrofitted in the writer said 
Instead of a contemplative space of moral cultivation, there was nothing but a shell of a building. The ground floor was almost derelict, stripped of value. Wiring was exposed, timber chipped, furnishings removed, finishes crumbling. It was a wreck. The floor pitted, concrete walls bare, dust everywhere. This is how we published the piece in the end. You can see the press release set at the top, accompanied by photographs of the same spaces below. When the writer spoke to the architects, he found that they hadn't known about the building's decline. They hadn't been back to the building since its completion. He'd actually had some trouble finding out exactly what had happened there as no one really wanted to talk about it. He surmised that it had something to do with the conditions of development, that many of the apartments had been bought as investments and therefore remained empty speculating even that a cynical developer might have benefited from sleek photographs of, an, of a library they had no intention of keeping. The project is obviously subject to a huge range of factors both before, during and after its construction and it could fall ill from a lack of maintenance at any time. And the conditions of development and the brief itself is generally just as culpable in the success of a project as the design itself. The architect's name gets paired with the project, but there is a limit to the amount of control they have over what the outcome is five years down the line. And when does their duty of care cease? What could they have done to prevent such a wasteful intervention? And indeed, was it preventable at all? Whether or not the architect knew about the project's decline, it was still being pushed out by their public relations team as a successful example of a community library. The horror lies in the idea that if we hadn't sent someone to see it, we would have relied solely on information from the architect and the press team, and we would have perpetuated this alternate reality in which the library is still functioning, in which it should be awarded as some kind of exemplary project. Staying with this idea of the duty of care, I'm gonna draw on one more example. I think that the architect role is pertinent here, but it's more a story of architectural media, which in this case had been almost entirely swept up in a story, in a compelling idea. Some of you may have heard about this as, as it was happening a few years ago. <clears throat> it's the story of the Makoko floating school. For some background, Makoko is a deeply impoverished area on the marshy waterfront of Lagos in Nigeria, settled by fishing communities from the 18th century. There's little infrastructural support there and it's considered by the government to be working against an idea of modernity for Lagos. And so the area has been subject to violent clearances. The floating school was devised by Kunle Adeyemi with his firm NLA Architects. He had studied in Lagos, working for OMA in Rotterdam for some time before starting NLA in Amsterdam in 2010. The school had initially been uh, intended as an extension to an existing structure that through its early stages was made symbolic as a saving grace for a community that was being targeted by state agents that wanted it gone. What was built and completed in March 2013 was a relatively simple structure floating out in the lagoon rather than extending the original school. This was hypothesized as making it resistant to flooding, but out there it was also more vulnerable to storms. The upper floor had been designated as classroom space, while a ground level was to provide space for fishermen to mend their nets. The architects brought Iwan Barn out to photograph the school at its opening, and this incredible, exciting, and evocative set of photographs exploded across architectural media. It's a stunning example of the role of photography in popularizing a project, in ensuring its media success. The project was praised as a model that could aid and elevate many more impoverished coastal communities, both in that region and elsewhere. And the AR was no exception in this. The school published on the cover of the September 2013 issue as proof of the transformational potential of architecture to address an extreme social context. Three years later, in May 2016, NLA was awarded the Silver Lion for MFS2 at the opening of Aravena's Venice Biennale. MFS2 was a replica of the first school, floating in the shipyards that lie towards the northern end of the Arsenale. About a week later, the original school in Makoko collapsed. It had collapsed during a storm, but it was not an exceptional storm. The facts emerged that the building had not been in use, that in its three-year lifespan, it had, held only, it had only held classes for about four months. A Lagos-based writer called Alan Gaistel tracked the full story of the school. 
finding exactly what had happened, exploring the full depths of the harm caused and of accountability for that harm. When Gaystall had visited in 2014, no classes were being held. Toilets and blackboards had still not been installed and the government was refusing to recognize it, considering it to be an illegal structure. A lot of media coverage had generally ignored the fact of neglect, preferring to focus on more hopeful narrative of an experimental structure that had the potential to transform other coastal communities in the region. In the summer of 2015, the school was eventually integrated into a governmental plan to regenerate Makoko. The architects had kept the duty of care for the building up to this point, um, doing some, some renovations on it. But they saw this as a point where the community could take ownership of their own structure and the upkeep was signed over to a local figurehead. In autumn of that year, two classes moved into the building, but the children were scared. Water was repeatedly breaching the school and the wind would shake it. And after a few months, they moved back out to their original space. The school became just one of many examples of facilities built in impoverished communities that are then left without ongoing funding or plans in place for their sustained maintenance that immediately become a burden when the duty of care is shifted to the community that they're built for. By May 2016, the anchoring that fixed the school in its position in the lagoon had been lost or stolen and without resources for it to be replaced, the school broke free and drifted away, colliding with several other structures. Unanchored and unkept, a storm, however unexceptional, was enough for the structure to give in. It's one thing for a developer to commission a brief that they have no desire to maintain, but it's another to impose a weight of maintenance on a vulnerable community that you claim to serve. From Gaystall's report, it seems that there was some concealment being done on the part of the architect and their liaisons in the community, but there was also some willful ignorance pervaded by the media coverage. The building is not even a cut and dry failure. Even though classes had only been held there for four months, the presence of the school over those three years and its international success contributed to the various factors of resistance against demolitions and violent evictions that were being made by the government at the time. The point is that the nuances of why the building wasn't working makes a far worse headline than the sensation of its potential, at least until the thing that has been built up came down again. But that nuance is always where reality lives, and we took this story to heart in what we value in building coverage now. When the school came down and the full extent of the damage became clear, we published an essay by Toma Berlanda, who had been at both at the school in Lagos in 2014 and in Venice two years later. I'm going to read a little bit of that essay for you. The collapse of the structure of the Makoko floating school faces us with a fundamental question of how to articulate judgment and inform an opinion on the role architecture has. Its iconic and pragmatic potential, celebrated also in the Venice Biennale's jury's decision to award Adeyemi the Silver Lion for a promising young participant, is well established and arguably gives hope to a new generation of architects educated in the global south that they too stand a chance to be recognised and celebrated in the international discourse. At the same time, that very discourse tends not to directly engage with the lives or indeed the opinions of the users, which too often only represent the backdrop. The floating school is a paradigmatic example of projects viewed from a distance, both in Lagos and abroad, where thousands of consumers of social media were captured by the fetishization of poverty architecture. So this sensationalism without cause, this flattening of nuance is what we're working against. The perpetuation of these slippery unrealities are what we're trying to prevent. It's why we insist on building visits and it's why we question what the press release says and consider the story that the photography is telling us just as much as what is written on the page because staging or falsification is easier than ever to do. We're trying to look for the depth in things. With the spread of COVID-19, we're now in a position where we're unable and unwilling to put writers and photographers in danger by sending them to buildings, most of which won't currently be in use anyway. Even as lockdowns start to cease, the way in which public buildings are used and engaged with is going to be vastly different. The way in which travel, both global and local, is thought about is likely to change forever. 
Reuters had already visited the buildings published in our May issue before local quarantine practices had begun, but our June issue was commissioned, produced and published while 2.6 billion people were confined indoors. The issue was on the subject of inside, uh, featuring essays, histories, poetry, a photo essay, and even a graphic novel without any studies of new buildings. We looked at the house as a public space, the architecture of quarantine, tiny homes, journeys around flats, desks, the photography of interior landscapes, body extending bubbles, claustrophobic corridors, and the depth of the window. We have been publishing essays and even fiction and poetry for some time, but it's entirely new for us to do so without in-depth building studies being part of that picture. As the situation continues to evolve unpredictably, we are not only having to rethink what an architecture magazine that can't cover new buildings can be, but having to move on our feet. We don't know how long it's going to be before we can visit buildings again. Issues on France, Bangladesh, and on public space and the right to the city were originally planned for later this year, but are having to be pushed back or completely rethought at the same time as people all over the world are having to rethink every structure from the ground up. Our next issue is going to be on architectural criticism itself, and we'll be looking at some of the things I've brought up today in a lot more depth, but we'll be looking at much more photography, film and fiction among them. A thought that I would like to end on is from Michael Sorkin, a brilliant critic who, to the great loss of the architectural community, passed away from coronavirus in March, and he's writing here on why we need criticism. He makes note of the fact that as inequalities become ever more dire, criticism becomes ever more vital. That the only rigorous criticism is one which has criticism directed back at itself, that is persistently self-critical and self-questioning. If there's a critique of the distribution of global assets and privilege, access to the beautiful must be among the goods indispensably on offer. But the question to be asked is whose interests are served and especially how particular interests shape relevant ideas of the good. Thus, a political criticism is urgently needed for a planet that is clearly going to hell in a handcart. And that's where I'm going to end. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Lily, for the mm. talk. Um, I turned on my video but should i turn it off um yes please everyone send send in your questions to arkinet me <laughs> um yeah okay i guess i can ask i have so many questions now lily <laughs> the beginning i beginning i prepared just one question but now i have much more uh it was it was a very interesting um presentation for me and I believe it was for many of us, um, uh, which I guess the, the main thing I felt is most of us are kind of busy on, the, on designing, you know, the uh, architecture rather than uh, really studying its impact before, uh, especially after, after um, the afterwards. Um, so I want to start with a personal question. If, if I may, um, you, you, did, um, you did your BA in architecture. It was yeah. uh, mostly a design course. And then you moved on. I don't know if, if I would call it moving on. It's kind of the same thing. Um, you, you, you did your MA in history of architecture at UCL. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that, how, uh, you were uh, kind of a distinguished um, student as a, in your dissertation at BA and then your thesis. How did that kind of come to you? And then you, you uh, after that, you started working uh, at the magazine. Um, mm. Yeah, personally, to how did that process Well, I go? mean, thank you for saying I was distinguished. Um, <laughs> well, I, I was always, um, maybe more interested in in writing and theory of architecture than I was in in practicing myself but I think it's it's something that's that's kind of interesting that 
every almost everyone who works on the editorial team of the AR now has had some degree of architectural training and I'm actually in I'm actually one of the less experienced in terms of architectural training in terms of the length of working in practice and in terms of the fact that my master's degree was in history rather than in architecture um and I yeah it's I'm I mean it's just it's just always kind of what's spoken to me a bit more but something that um, our deputy editor said uh, when we were recently talking about the fact that we are all architecturally trained is that somehow by by being in this position of, of writing about architecture and of publishing architecture we have we're almost more immersed in it than when we we're practicing because when you're practicing you're so focused on on the particular projects that you're doing for us we are able to cast a bit of a wider net and have a bit more of a look at what uh, everything that's going around and you get a better a slightly better idea maybe of the breadth of the culture because that's what you're doing that's what your job is to to try and understand uh, the kind of wider context mm -hmm. um and how, how is it different, you know, the academic kind of um, study and what you do at the magazine in terms of research and writing? Is it very different? In your I, find, I find it very different, yeah. In terms of academic study, um, things tend to have a very narrow focus and tend to be something that you would research for quite long periods of time relative to what we do now, where every issue takes about a month to, to produce um, in, terms of, in terms of actual time focused on that issue. So we'll be commissioning for an issue while we're still working on the last one, but it's about, it's about a month cycle where we're kind of focused on one thing more than another thing. And so that kind of time frame is obviously much faster than, than building architecture and is, and is, is incredibly fast in, in, t in relation to how long it takes to, to make a building. Um, but it's all, I think also faster than academia I found in academic articles. And uh, is it, does it mean it's more stressful now? Um, or is it kind of the same? I don't, it's, it's not really more stressful. I'd say it's more, it's just a different pace. Where, yeah. bef where before, and I think with a lot of architectural projects, you have um, a very large body of work, which is all going to be due at a certain time. And you need to be meeting kind of certain certain deadlines along that route certain smaller deadlines that are part of a larger thing um it feels almost just more continuous um mm. working in publishing and in terms of the language mm -hmm. so you mentioned how you, may, you kind of mentioned the, the, the difference in process and uh, the focus and the time period spent but in terms of the the written language is it that different it is quite different. Um, we publish some work that is slightly more academic in style, but we also publish things that are closer to what seem, what kind of reads like journalism, um, some things that might be closer to what you would maybe call like an opinion piece, um, but also also, like I said, fiction and poetry. So it's we it's really a massive range that we that we deal with, which is I think keeps it interesting as well. Do you do you consciously keep your audience like as a general public or more like people who you know designers and architects and historians? You kind of try to keep a balance between all that. I guess that's what I understand. I think we we really like the idea that our audience would be architects but also would be accessible and interesting to people who don't work in architecture um architects are probably our kind of key audience and 
obviously as we're all architecturally trained we kind of have an affinity with that but it's yeah it's one of the kind of greatest compliments when someone who's not architecturally trained still finds it engaging and interesting and relevant um and so that's kind of we we aim to do both really um and um just give me a second Um, the topics that you touched, they, mm -hmm. they kind of go, um, maybe, maybe, maybe not all, all of the topics that you, um, write and deal about and study, uh, reflect in the magazine. Um, but I kind of felt it touched on the, um, the social, like the heavily, um, sociological and political. So in a way, um, it has a much more audience than architects in a way. And yeah. uh, do, does that, do, can you measure, because you mentioned how the magazine has the role of, uh, uh, the archival role and the role uh, of, 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 uh, of change, of campaign and, mm. and so on. And you do a lot of, it's not just the magazine, the, the, the printed magazine, but uh, the um, many uh, other events that you do uh, as the architecture of the review, I believe. Um, do, can you measure in a way the, the impact that you have or how do you measure it? Uh, I'm not sure it is measurable actually. Um, but you have the, your... Uh, the Especially we have the, is yeah. where um, sorry the yeah the best gauge we have is when we get is when we get direct feedback basically people speaking to us or emailing us telling us about what about if something they've found good something they haven't liked um, I think I think the best kind of almost measurable thing that's happened recently is that we uh, in last year we did an issue on um, the islands of Ireland and as part of that we had an essay which was about houses in Dublin and how the architectural um, procurement system in Ireland was very restricting and prevented all but kind of already quite heavily established practices from being able to get a footing in any public commissions and it was just really stifling the culture of emerging and young practices there and when I say young I mean people in their 40s as well um, so we had this essay about it we had some case studies with some young practices and one and and some of these practices as a result ended up all in, perhaps not as a result directly of this, but um, kind of fed back that it was a um, some kind of cohesive moment where they have started a uh, political lobby now collectively and have banded together to try and change that procurement system. And I think that that is that was one of the most heartening things that I think happened. Um, when, when they told us about what they were doing with that, the fact that even if, even if we didn't start anything that wasn't already there, the idea that bringing the station to a kind of international magazine and, and publicly saying that we felt this to be a, a critical issue in some way managed to I don't know, strengthen their position or, or give them more space, I think was, that was, that was really heartening for me. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question from Noor. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Lily, for the interesting talk. I have a question regarding the fact that the content of the publication being specialized is their strategy the strategy is to make the contents more accessible to the public who are, who are not specialists. So are there any other modes of dissemination that you guys use, like podcasts or video? 
Uh, and then she has another question, which after you answer. Um, so we have we have some things that we that we try to do to to kind of be more accessible in terms of the commissioning the content itself. We generally try to not be too consistently academic in tone and to have language that is generally quite understandable but um, in terms of other forms of media we have recently started a um, reading list which we do every week for people who are registered so not subscribers but people who've registered for a free account on the website um, will get a weekly reading list with seven pieces which we've kind of collected from the archive that um, sometimes kind of relevant at the time or just nice pieces that we wanted to bring together. So we hope that that's kind of a way of making our archive more accessible. Um, but we also, I'm, I, we haven't, we haven't launched this yet and, and nothing is, is really, um, has been officially said, but we are, we are working on a podcast, which we've been doing for the last few weeks with, architects, critics and historians um, kind of working within the architectural field talking about their their bookshelf and what they're reading at the moment, what, you know, the books they'd recommend to a young architect. So um, that's not, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm even supposed to be talking about that yet, but it's, um, it's, so the it's main thing is the, um, so the main thing is the printed magazine, right? Yeah. Which is which people subscribe to, and then uh, and then what else is, are there in terms of mediums? You have a website, but can people we, access to the, to the whole of the magazine, the website, or is it more selected? How does it work? So with the with the website, it's um, it's free for subscribers to read as much as they want, and for registered users, um, they get a certain amount of articles for per month and they get the weekly reading lists which are all free every week um mm. and uh, we have and then twitter you use social well. media as well right yeah yeah Instagram, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and uh what if, uh, i um i believe uh, the architecture review has a, a very rich archive is that accessible to everyone who subscribes yeah so the the archive is is accessible to anyone who subscribes at the moment we um are only in the works in terms of digitizing our full archive it's a project that mm -hmm. is that we feel is really important that that the full archive should be available online we're not quite there yet so at the moment mm -hmm. anything that was published before about 2010 um that has that is now on the website has been uploaded kind of personally by someone who works there who's gone to the scanner and 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 scanned the whole thing and uploaded it to the website manually um so there there is yeah. a lot of really amazing stuff on there there's, so still, there's some really the, great pieces the original the publication was all printed thing was digital yeah, yeah yeah so um yeah so some really amazing pieces from the 50s and 60s um 70s like the whole from the, from the whole kind of history. There's a bit less from, from the first few decades, but um, there's, yeah, so there's a good selection on there. Quite, quite a lot. There's at least a couple hundred articles, I think. Um, but we want to do more online. <laughs> yeah. And um, this is a question from Nada. Uh, regardless mm -hmm. of the medium, generally speaking, the elites and those in power uh, choose who is worthy of fame and hence dictators all what, what culture is. How important is the documentation and publication of everyday architecture for society? Would it be accept acceptable to start bold, bold features as outrage or man's plan in the Middle East? Um, I, don't, I don't feel like I'm in a position to talk about um, the Middle East specifically. It's not my mm -hmm. <laughs> area of expertise. Yeah. Um, I think that, um, 
Yeah, I mean, perhaps Ubadi, you want to comment on that? In the no, no, you can in the context of okay, Europe. Um, do you do you feel as a magazine? Can you hear me? Uh, just yeah. about. You're breaking up a little bit, but I can understand. Is 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 it better now? Yes. Uh, in the context of UK, um, the how how does it go in the editorial team? I mean, how how do you guys um, are, are there like many different ideas that go on in terms of what what to write about, who to feature, and in, in terms of uh, towards the end of your your presentation, you mentioned um, the some some um, buildings that may not be worthy of talking um, uh, may need to be featured in the magazine or be talked about. Um, mm. how, how does that process of choosing that goes? Because the printed, uh, printed edition is like a limit. You have a limit and you have to fill it and there's probably a lot to choose from. Yeah, um, there definitely is. And I think the themes are really helpful for that. So it has to feel not just um, timely in terms of in terms of what's going on at the moment and relevant to kind of what's happening in architecture at the time, but also it has to be um, relevant for the theme. So, for example, in our in our April issue on darkness, we um, featured a, a museum that might not have really come through, that might not even have been on our radar if we hadn't been specifically looking for buildings that could contribute to this theme. Um, we and we featured a, an, a kind of unfinished climate museum um, in, in Spain as well, which was a kind of very interesting story, but the building was still unfinished it kind of ran out of funding and had um and had become a kind of temporary public space until it could be completed for its original purpose um and so there are things that that end that do come up which which wouldn't otherwise and in terms of how we get there it's um it's just a a lot of research um, and then we come together in content meetings we talk about what we found what we like what stories might be behind the things that that we are thinking about whether it's an important building because it's reusing kind of found materials or because it's telling because it's kind of tapping into a greater sort of social narrative um, so yeah, it's just it's really through just talking to each other. There are only a few of us, so even with um, even while working in our separate homes, we're able to to kind of communicate. I see your your editor also joined us, Manon. Thanks for joining. I, I Hi, Manon. See her name. <laughs> That's, yeah. Um, okay, we have another question. Let me find one. Um, Okay, someone, Nada also again asking about, um, if you can reflect on um, how, how you find the writing about architecture brings about change faster and more often impact than built architecture. Is there, um, do you distinguish between kind of the impact of a built architecture, let's call it built architecture and the, and, 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 and the literature? Do, do they have kind of a different mm. impact uh, of change or how does it work? I think it's, it's an interesting point and um, it's something that um, I've been thinking about for some time is this, is, is whether architecture can be political um, in itself, whether it can make a political statement. And there's, there's this, uh, there's this essay by Frederick Jameson um, called Is Space Political, where he kind of puts forward this idea that architecture, to an extent, can't be political because, uh, because of all of the many factors that, that impact it when it is coming to be, 
largely financial, but generally just the pressures that kind of are enforced on things as they enter into the world. And at the point of its construction, it becomes part of the mainstream. At the point of its acceptance, it becomes part of the mainstream and gets absorbed into that culture. And um, I, I find myself somewhat disagreeing with him about the impossibility of architecture being itself political and not just being subsumed into a kind of mainstream uh, about its potential to be revolutionary. But I haven't been able to yet fully articulate what it is about that that I think is is still possible. It, it seems maybe too uh, fatalistic to consider the idea that architecture can't be a force for change. Um, mm. But hopefully we'll, I will be able to articulate it soon. <laughs> Um, so in, in terms of your audience, it's, uh, it's basically written in English, uh, mm -hmm. but you kind of, you kind of study, uh, like you mentioned the issue on, uh, the, uh, in different locations around the world. Um, but do you publish or are there any plans of publishing in different languages, especially Arabic since mostly here, someone asked if you are thinking about publishing it in Arabic or anything, but, or in we... any language. <laughs> We haven't actually published in other languages. We do sometimes commission writers who are um, not native English speakers and who will write in their own language. And then we have it translated um, and occasionally we'll publish the translation with the original text on our website. But in terms of, of publishing in additional languages, as a team who are all kind of predominantly English speaking, Manon is French, but speaks incredibly fluent English. Um, <laughs> we don't really have the capacity to be commissioning anything that isn't kind of translated into English. We often can't edit something until it's been translated even. Um, mm. And I think wouldn't feel incredibly comfortable editing in a in a language that we don't that we aren't familiar with. Um, mm. But that isn't to say that uh, that our work can't be translated. I think we had a um, we had a piece on the bed by Beatrice Colomina, which I believe was recently translated into Arabic. Um, and I can, I can, prob I think, try and dig that up, but I can't remember uh, the name of the platform who published it. Um, yeah, so we're very happy when other people want to translate and, uh, and have our work have a further reach as well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, this is a, this might be a hard question. Um, this is from Afra, you know Afra. I know Afra. Hi Afra. Uh, so here it goes. Have you ever, were you ever forbidden to issue a writing? Uh, if, if yes, what happens to those writings? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think two um, questions. One is, uh, have you ever, uh, as, as an historian, uh, refused to publish a writing from a commission, you know, a writing that you commissioned? Or uh, if, if, it, if, if there was a, a writing that didn't make it to the magazine for any other reason what happens to that so um i i've never personally been prevented from from writing something um we have i think in on i think i can think of one occasion um when we commissioned something and we ended up just not the essay um it was just it was a it was an essay about um about the legacy of colonialism and the slave trade in in barbados um i believe and the first writer who we commissioned the essay from um it it just wasn't it just wasn't 
good. It was it was kind of apolitical to the point of being incredibly problematic. Um, and we felt that it would it was just be absolutely wrong to publish it. Um without it kind of just didn't have the acknowledgement of the weight of the cruelty um in it. And so we um we uh we paid the author a um what's called a, a kill fee, which is um you, they they they're still paid but we don't publish the piece and we commissioned uh someone else who to to write about the same topic who did a much better job um in the end and so i mean yeah there are a couple of things that if if sometimes pieces fall through as well sometimes f writers just don't file um it's kind of a matter of time of do we have time to commission someone else um or do we just have to move some pages around so that there's not a four pages of white space in the magazine. Um, there is another question. Where did your magazine, uh, magazine's name come from? Where did it come from? Um, Any, anything? History? I, I don't actually know. I think um, because it wasn't originally called the Architectural Review, um, it kind of, it emerged out of um, another uh, out of a publication of a much longer and more um, a much clumsier name which I can't even remember now but it, it became the architectural review very very early on um, and was part of the architectural press um, which also publishes the or also published when it existed the architects journal which is a um, it's a, a magazine that's much more news based about just specifically British architecture and its circulation is kind of much more limited to Britain because it doesn't really look at architecture outside of that context and doesn't look at kind of global things in the same way. Thanks. Um, I, will, I will ask you one last question and then we will connect um, a, um, a thief for a, for a he will ask the question himself. Um, so my last question would be, in the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned how the, um, the, the culture, of, uh, um, the male culture that was influenced kind of in the writings of, of architecture and uh, the male figure, the male character being the, the dominant kind of character in the writings. And then, um, Today, when I see kind of your team, uh, your your editor, and I believe I'm not sure. But I, when I see the list, is that uh, more than half of the editorial team are women? I believe, right? Yeah, right. I mean, and how, the, is that is that does um, that reflect the, a, a change in the culture? Is is that like a a good reflection, a positive reflection of the change in culture, or what else uh, are there that need to be changed? I, I, I'd like I'd like to think so um, and in fact um, almost all of the editorial team uh, are women with the exception of Tom Carpenter who is our, our designer and art director um, and it took a very long time for the architectural review to even have a, a woman as an editor um, the first how would that woman be last was Slesser. Who, how many years? How sorry? Many, how many um, years? Well, the first editor was Catherine Slesser. Uh, first female editor was Catherine Slesser in 1991. So mm -hmm. um, almost 100 years. Since um, <laughs> wow. Um, and and the, the, the culture that Kath faced when she became editor was brutal and incredibly different to what we have now. Um, the the current culture is one that is just so much more welcoming from the stories that that I've heard um, of how kind of things used to be. So I think it's I think that it's a really positive change in the culture. We try very hard to to kind of work collaboratively and to support each other. Um, 
and to kind of eradicate older ideas about competition and um, I think that we're doing a pretty good job. I think you are. Um, Doc, yeah, um, apparently, oh, someone is asking your surname. Yes. Kind of a person, because it, where, where does it come from? What does it mean? <laughs> um, it's, it's an interesting uh, surname. It's a Polish me. surname. Uh, my father is Polish. Um, and Who is with us as well. Yes, he's also watching. <laughs> Um, and I think it translates as something like person who lives across the river. That's great. Okay, you look tired, so I'll ask two last questions from people and then we can close it up. <laughs> um, so this is a good question. What, um, what, do you have any advice to those who are interested to explore their writing, the talent in writing? And what, what's the best strategy to develop as a specialized writer? Mm. So, I mean, the first thing I would say is to just read a lot and read as much as you can and from as many different sources as you can. Um, and the second thing is to practice. And I definitely um, found it really hard to motivate myself to write without a deadline. Mm -hmm. um, and was kind of unable to even fabricate my own deadlines. Um, it's definitely something that other people have said is very helpful to fabricate your own deadlines. But if you can find a way to mean so that you have to write something by a certain time. And for me, the magazine has been really helpful in terms of the consequences of if I don't write. <laughs> um, so kind of trying, trying to set some kind of condition where you are forced into writing where you have to produce something and then just trying as hard as you can to make that thing that you produce be something that you can stand behind and something that you're proud of. You also publish your, you have some writings that uh, not, you don't, don't just edit, um, but you also write. Yeah, um, I write. I write articles. for the magazine. We, which, we is, all which, is also too, which is also true for them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so we can have the question from Artif. I asked to unmute. Yep. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. Finally, huh? Yeah. Um, um, thank you, Lily, for the presentation. I enjoyed uh, the slides. You know, minimalist but very rich with. Um, pages of the magazine along the years. Um, my question, I had like a number of questions that kept mutating in my mind until now. So this is the last edition. Um, you, um, you, you write about projects. I mean, not you personally, but the magazine publishes about project, projects internationally mm -hmm. outside of London. And um, I'm, I'm not sure... Uh, like how how does this impact you know your jur journalism when you cross uh, cultural borders? Uh, I know that you report facts and you publish photographs, but then um, how do you um, like how serious is is the involvement of the of the magazine? And I'm not being critical of AR itself, but Generally, uh, here in the Middle East, I come from, or I am in the Middle East. Uh, when I read anything about architecture in the Middle East, which is my interest, but also in other places of, of the world, um, for uh, a European journal, it would be just, you know, very simple in passing reporting. You know, it's, there is not much involvement. And I'm not sure, you know, somebody spoke about the linguistic divide, but I think it's more than that. Um, that is one question. Um, the other, like, shorter question is, um, you mentioned, and I tend to believe it, that a magazine or a, or a journal is, is, is a platform to ex exchange opinion, but, and that might have been very true 100 years ago before the telegraph and the typewriter. But recently, I mean, now we live in this age of, you know, media boom and um, 
you know, the projects that you write about and you wait to publish for months later are, are already everywhere in, in, in media and social media. And there is a lot of platform um, uh, crowdfunded or crowdsourced, and I'm sorry, crowdsourced by the people, architects and people who are interested. How do you keep your, your, I mean, a magazine or a, an architectural journal, which is a niche subject in the world of journalism, how do you keep it relevant um, to, to uh, at, and, and, and afloat also at the same time? Thank you. Um, thank you for your questions. Um, thank you. To the, to the first one, in terms of um, addressing context outside of what's familiar to us, this is, this is crucially why we commission writers who are from the places that they're writing about or, or live there or are very familiar with the places that they're writing about. And to a great extent, we have to trust our writers in what they write about that place. Um, it's, it's kind of what I discussed to the, towards the earlier part of the talk where it, it's this idea that, that that person's subjectivity is going to cut closer to the truth than than someone who is writing about it from a thousand miles away. Um, and I th the, the aim that we that we really take on with, um, especially when we do issues about uh, another country, is this idea that it would be interesting and relevant to someone who is not from there, who has never lived there, but also that it would hold relevance for people who are from that place where ideally there's something new that being raised that they would maybe also not have heard raised before, that it feels relevant to, to, to both people. And it's a really delicate line to walk, but it's something that we find really important. And I think that a lot of that is achieved through writers who are, who are local and, and by, by kind of talking to, to those people and, and finding out what they have to say and taking some guidance from them as well. Um, to the second point, um, yes, there are more platforms um, now, but as I kind of discussed, uh, the way in which those platforms discuss uh, different ideas is is vastly is vastly different to how how the magazine can discuss an idea um, and there's because of the fleeting nature of of a lot of contemporary media a lot of those things become flattened and become only very skin deep become very thin in their arguments um, and part of what we're doing that's different is that we have space and that we um, commit space to developing an argument to a greater to a greater depth and and um, also in terms of combining it rigorously with images and with photographs drawings that um, either support or or in kind of provocation with with the words that we publish so i um i mean you feel free to disagree but i think we're bringing something valuable that you can't find on other platforms on on a lot of on a lot of websites on social media as well that there's certainly a lot of areas for debate and for conversation but those are limited to much shorter much briefer and much more kind of flattened out um, ways of ways of communicating. Uh, and in terms of how we stay afloat, um, it's partially through descriptions, through people who like us believe that um, that print like this is worth supporting, um, which is which is and that's become even more crucial since um since we've been confined indoors where um 
architectural journalism is is kind of partially funded through um, a series of kind of awards and events and through a public relations machine where oh, certain projects will will kind of enter to um, to try and gain some kind of recognition, some kind of acclaim. This is part of, I, I could talk about this for another hour easily, so I'm going to keep it uh, quite brief. Um, but that model since coronavirus has swept the globe is vastly reducing because of the inability of these things to be properly visited, but also um, for, for events surrounding these things to be run and so we're kind of in a very strange new situation where we're returning to a subscription model which is a maybe slightly older version of how things might be financed but uh, is is kind of turning out to be a little bit more sustainable perhaps um thank you lily can you take one more question for someone yes yeah okay Great. Uh, Mr. Uh, Abdelfatlah Mamin want, wants to ask also another audio question. Let me ask when we get... Yes. To... Hello. 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 Hello, everybody. Uh, dear Lily, we, uh, thank you so much. We, we've enjoyed uh, such a beautiful, distinguished session. Uh, we, we lack uh, so much within our... Uh, local uh, professional societies and activities and so. Um, probably, in my opinion, uh, part of it uh, culturally, how much we read and so. And I addressed a question and I was so happy that you, you commented even before I, I, I complete my, my question with regard how to develop uh, local talent uh, or, or skills in, in architectural professional writing uh, and that you have answered the probably uh, much of, of, of the question, but my second related question, uh, uh, if, if that's so, uh, could you and your position and your effort and your, uh, uh, that much of given to the profession uh, could help in bridging those possible talent and be like an incubator by giving them a chance, especially when it got to, to the question that uh, my dear Dr. Atif asked, to develop local, uh, kind of correspondent, uh, correspondent writers and so. We have some uh, few talent, probably need opportunities, need people like you who could really take them by hand and lead them into developing their skills and help to weigh, uh, you know, kind of win-win situation. We need to develop such uh, skills within our uh, local societies to complete the whole, uh, you know, effective uh, story of practice, of, of knowledge, of uh, sh knowledge sharing. And uh, you need people uh, to kind of uh, bring to you the best picture of, of all the potential, all uh, the real uh, development, all the, the historical uh, fact uh, reading and, and transfer and so. So in your position, would you, and, and this is a, a, a kind of, uh, asking, you know, uh, a gesture, uh, a, a potential opportunity from you to our young talent, especially those who has interest. How could they be given opportunity to kind of link with you and help you, but they help themselves and help their society? Uh, is there any uh, kind of proposal like this, or could you take an initiative from from this beautiful session and you being with us? Uh, in this uh, very kind of uh, awkward, unique uh, situation. Uh, it's a beautiful opportunity from, we got it from our agony, but this is, this is the beauty of, of this uh, modern era. Thank you. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, we, so we don't have a, um, we don't have like a, a program for, um, for, people who who like a kind of internship program or anything like that but for people who are interested in 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 writing about architecture or about um or in kind of developing the, the this kind of like critical these critical positions or in or in thinking more about 
about how architecture should be written about we i mean absolutely are very interested in emerging writers as well as emerging architects and people who are able to write about different different things different places in the world and different ideas um and absolutely if you if you're a young writer and you want to pitch an idea our inboxes are always open um and i mean i can i can be contacted on uh on instagram or the my email is in the um is on the ar's website as well i can um, share it with so, everyone here yeah, yeah we talked um, earlier if people wanted to get in touch um i i mentioned instagram because my I think my hand will be in the um, in the talk for this, but absolutely do send us ideas and pitches, um, and we're always interested in in. Wonderful. So I I consider this is as as uh, this uh, initiative uh, from you to to welcome uh, even if it may start a voluntary uh, interested in different topics of at least on local uh, architecture and uh, related subjects. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Um, Lily? Hello? Can you hear me? Hello, Lily. I think we have a problem, or maybe I have a problem. Hello. Hi, sorry. Hello. My yeah, internet okay. dropped. I thought my internet dropped. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure. Okay, thank you very much, Lily. Um, this, is a, this is very exciting for me now because I will end it and I, I, and I will try to end it like they end it in, in a broadcast, radio broadcast. So this was um, Printing Archite Architecture with Lily Sozicki from London. Uh, I'm Mubad Anuji from Istanbul. Thank you very much to Lily. Thank you very much to everybody who joined us and to Arcunet for organizing this, for Mohammed for uh, going through all the technical difficulties that we, we had uh, today here. I um, hope to hear and see you again. Also, also, one last thing, people, if people want to uh, subscribe or to uh, find more about the Architecture Review, they can go to the website, the Architecture Review, is it the architecturereview.com? How does it go? It's Yeah, the, if you just Google it, the Architecture <laughs> Review. Yeah. It's the architecturereview.com slash uh, subscriptions if you would like to subscribe. Um, or just the architecturalreview.com if you want to have a look at our content um, you can you can register and start getting free um, reading lists Fantastic. to your inbox if you want um, but yeah I, I do recommend having a look around obviously yeah. um, thank you very much Lily thank you everyone bye bye <laughs>